In all seriousness, this is a 90 slide presentation. However, um, we will be, uh, it won't go that slowly. It is, it has an enormous amount of detail, predominantly because we will be placing all of these online for parents to be able to search through them and see neighborhood by neighborhood and piece by piece, okay? Um, so, uh, for most of you, laying the groundwork for why the redistricting was necessary, if you saw the forum that we did at Wright Denny or saw it online or the presentation that we did, um, we continue to experience we are one of uh, eight counties in the entire state that are actually experiencing growth. While West Virginia altogether lost more than 1,000 students last year, we gained 60. We're actually averaging 71 additional students per year. If you look over the last five years, we will reach 10,000 kids by 2027. And that is not nearly as far away as it sounds. So part of our work has been for us to look at our current performance and see how we could best utilize our resources. So. I will say a couple of things about this redistricting plan. And for those of you who are taking pictures, we will make sure I will have copies of this online for you. Every one of these slides, the charts that are in them will be posted and we'll have additional public forums. So um, first and foremost, this chart represents the genesis of this entire project. We sat down beginning last December with the Jefferson Planning Commission and looking at, number one, what tools we had available to us now. We heat mapped the present location of every single student in the county. And if you'll see this map, you'll notice that there are some particular places where there are enormous levels of growth, okay? We then sat down with the commission and we said, that tells us where everyone is now and sort of codifies our problem. What we need are good projective analytics. And that's where we sat down and worked very closely with the county planner, GIS mappers. And we went through and predominantly we laid all of these different pieces of information over each other. Where do we have growth in the county? Who has pay paid for a building permit and hasn't put a house on there yet? Who has agricultural set aside so we know they won't grow anymore? What neighborhoods are already built out? So yes, there's residential there, but we won't have any more growth in that area. So we overlaid all of these and created one master map to show us the level of growth neighborhood by neighborhood in every slot in Jefferson County. All right, so understanding that is going to help you understand the genesis of this. So I am going to take a few minutes to go through this chart so that you understand the basis, and then you'll see where this led us in terms of decision making. So for all of the schools, elementary to middle to high school are listed here. The child count tells you how many students are currently enrolled in that class. For elementary, we also added the on-site preschoolers. We actually have more than 320 preschoolers in this county. We simply don't have space for all of them. The ones who aren't listed here are in private facilities. Program capacity. This is how much room is in this school. How many seats are in that building? How many kids can we put in there? This is an interesting beast. It is a formula that the school building authority utilizes for how many students you can put in a room for general education, special education. There have been a couple of changes to this from our original. One was on TA Lowry because of the number of special education classes that we have. Special education classes and those students require a great deal of equipment. You can put far fewer students in those rooms than you can a general education class. The other one is Harper's Ferry Middle School. We found in SBA's formula that they had not accounted for uh, all of the additional classrooms that were put on when they did the renovations at Harper's Ferry, so it changed their capacity numbers. But this is how many seats you have, this is how many kids you have, hence a formula that says what percent full is this school. For instance, your school is 100% full when you have 435 seats and you have 437 kids in your school, okay? <laughs> Your school is 96% full when you have 1,579 kids and you can hold 1,639. So these are the percentages. 
Now, what you see here are the averages of those. If you took every seat that we had in every elementary school all together and every child that we had, we're 76% full across all elementary schools, okay? So that explains this. What SBA says is the ideal is do not exceed 85%. When they bring in their formula, they say for a school to function well, it should stay at 85% or lower. That way you have pullout space, you have flexibility, you have rooms for art, music, P, all of these other functions to run within a school. So the next row on this chart is how much room there is to put additional children into the building, how much space you have left. And then for you to be in an ideal range, how many more, few, fewer students would you need? So I'm gonna back up to this for some explanation. When we looked at these charts, we sat and went through every one of these catchment areas. Blue Ridge Campus, we pulled up the Blue Ridge Campus and we looked at how much growth how much room for growth they had in the next five to 10 years. And every single one of these schools and the areas that they pulled from were either categorized as low growth areas, there's not a lot of development there or there's not a lot of room to grow into there, or they were categorized as high growth areas. There's a great deal of development. There are a great many permits there that, that they're just waiting to turn the key and build more houses on, and we expect a great deal more residential growth in those areas, okay? So for every school, it is classified as either where I pull my students from is low growth or where I pull my students from is high growth, right? This was used to set a range. So when you look and you say that elementary average is 76%, okay? That's about somewhere in the middle. Uh, how many years ago uh, Washington High was built? This is ninth year. Ninth year. So nine years ago when Washington High was built and they separated those students and redistricted, they separated them evenly and they had even numbers and over time, Jefferson's catchment area, they have grown that much faster than Washington. They are a high growth area. If we were to simply reset everyone to exactly even numbers tomorrow, in two years, three years, the high growth areas will be overcrowded again and the low growth areas will stay the same. So what we did is we took everyone's range and we said, okay, if you are a high growth school, we're going to keep you at the bottom of the range, take more students off of you, keep you at, at the lower end. If you're a low growth school, we're gonna put you at the high end of the range because you're not gonna grow much. And over time, in the next three to five years, you guys will even out again. Does that make sense? I see some nodding heads. So remember, we are not trying to get everyone in the county at a flat 75% or a flat 80%. We set for every single grade level an ideal range, and we said if you're high growth, we'll keep you at the lowest end of that range. If you're low growth, we'll keep you at the highest end, so that as you, over the, over the years, you'll stay closer together. This is what informed all of the work that comes after this. And uh, so to be clear, your growth rate <clears throat> is based on working with the county and others to, on the projection of uh, development in that respective area or looking geographically at what's even possible in that area um, and not looking at the capacity of the school itself. Yes, sir, that is entirely correct. That is entirely correct. It is based on us looking at every one of the urban growth boundaries, where there are incentives in place from the county or from the city of Ranson to build for builders, places where they've already paid for permits, places where there are set asides to take things out of that. So it's, we took the boundary of where that school draws students from and there, and we demarcated them by how much growth they could have over that time, school by school. 
So we also, within this formula, looked at, so if you were low growth or high growth and what percentage you should be at, here's how many plus or minus students you should have to sort of hit your ideal, what your student population would be like after redistricting. And then we added, as uh, one of our citizens just spoke about, the transfer effect that we have. Currently, 5% of the total school population of Jefferson County Schools transfers every year. It has a rather substantial effect on our staffing, on our transportation, and on our planning. So we both can figure the changes with and without transfers so that you can see what that looks like. And part of what this committee did do, which you will hear later in the evening, is suggest revisions to the transfer policy to help support some of these suggested changes. Okay, that was actually, lucky you, the most painful part of this entire thing. <laughs> getting through that, getting through understanding that chart. So. After this, um, Mr. Willingham is going to come up and we are going to walk you through the process. We started with high schools, we'll go through these. One, we'll explain the process that we went through, then we'll go to middle schools, explain the process we went through, exact same in elementary. You'll, you'll catch the rhythm of it. So would you like to get us started, Mr. Willingham? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. It's warm in here. It is though. <laughs> Okay, uh, you see before you the current high school districts, the way that they are today. Middle school, the way that they are today. And our elementary district. Our current Jefferson High School District, 103.67 square miles and there are currently 1,579 students, current grades nine through 12. Washington High School, 110.87 square miles, 1,202 students, current grades nine through 12. The middle to high school feeder. Um, and this may be a good moment to interject. <clears throat> feeder patterns is a very important concept for the committee for two reasons. First and foremost, feeder patterns are what um, help determine um, social groups for students, keeping them together and them having working strong peer relationships as they move through school from elementary to middle to high school. Um, while yes, we're an educational institution, we are also next to the family, uh, one of the strongest socialization forces um, in a democracy or in a society and it is important for us to support relationship for children so to the extent that we can we like to keep feeder patterns what we call clean or 100% you would like to go to the same school as all of your friends geographically and numerically that is not always possible when it was we chose to keep feeder patterns as clean as we possibly could it is also of a great benefit to the staff and supporting the students because if you're articulating up to one school those school counselors working together and having good conversations and knowing the options and knowing those opportunities also help support kids as they go through the process. So that being said, you'll see that Charlestown Middle feeds 100% into Washington High and Jefferson Middle feeds 100% into Jefferson High. Wildwood Middle feeds 97.5% to Jefferson and 2.46 into Washington. And we'll see where those breakdowns are in a moment. Harpers Ferry Middle, 51.12 to Washington and 48.8 to Jefferson. The Harpers Ferry split, uh, Harpers Ferry Middle split, if you'll see the uh, top half of the bold blue, the northern part goes to Jefferson High and the southern part of the dark bold blue goes to Washington High. That's your 51%. You'll see two small areas um, below the bold black line. Um, there are a small percentage of students who reside. That's the south side of Leetown Road. And those students go to Wildwood and then bounce back to Washington High. Bolivar and Harpers Ferry. This would be the Bolivar, town of Bolivar and town of Harpers Ferry. 
48 students, current grades 8 through 11, that would go from Jefferson High School, which is 7.5 miles away, to Washington High, which is 10.06 miles away. Currently feeds C.W. Shipley, Harpers Ferry, and Jefferson, and they, the proposed would be Shipley, Harpers Ferry, and Washington. Carriage Park Community. 19 students, current grades 8 through 11 from Jefferson High, which is 7.2 miles away to Washington, which is nearly 7. Currently feeds C.W. Shipley, Harpers Ferry, and Jefferson. The proposal would be Shipley, Harpers Ferry, and Washington. The community of Sheridan Estates currently feeds C.W. Shipley, Harpers Ferry, and Jefferson. Proposed to feed Shipley, Harpers Ferry, and Washington. 32 students, current grades 8 through 11 from Jefferson, 5.9 miles to Washington, 7.1. Halltown Road. There are four students here, current grades 8 through 11 from Jefferson, 4.8 miles away to Washington, 6 miles away. Currently feeds C.W. Shipley, Harpers Ferry, and Jefferson. The proposal, C.W. Shipley, Harpers Ferry, Washington. Area of Sleepy Hollow uh, currently feeds Driswood, Wildwood, and Jefferson. The proposal, Driswood, Harper's Ferry Middle, and Washington High. Three students, current grades 8 through 11, from Jefferson High to Washington. Community Breckenridge currently feeds Driswood, Wildwood, and Jefferson. The proposal, Driswood, Harper's Ferry, and Washington. 71 students here, current grades 8 through 11 from Jefferson, which is nearly three miles away, to Washington, roughly six miles away. Patrick Henry Way. Current feeder is Driswood, Wildwood, and Jefferson. Proposed would be Driswood, Harpers Ferry Middle, and Washington High. 27 students here, current grades 8 through 11. From Jefferson High, which is 4.8 miles away, to Washington, 4.5 miles away. Community of Schaefer's Crossing. Currently feeds C.W. Shipley, Harpers Ferry, and Jefferson. Proposed to feed C.W. Shipley, Harpers Ferry, Middle, and Washington High. 28 students here. Current grades 8 through 11 from Jefferson. 4.2 miles away to Washington, 5.3. Ask a question. Is that behind all these? It is. <laughs> Preserves at Barleywood. Uh, currently feeds South Jefferson, Wildwood, and Jefferson. Jefferson High, proposal to feed South Jefferson, Charlestown Middle, and Washington High. 13 students here, current grades 8 through 11, 8.8 .8 miles away to Jefferson High, to Washington, 5.73. The area of Hidden River off of Route 51, currently feeds South Jefferson, Wildwood, and Jefferson High, proposed to feed South Jefferson, Charlestown Middle, and Washington High. 19 students here, current grades 8 through 11, from Jefferson High to Washington. Areas of North Childs Road, Rose Hill Drive, Shadowhawk Lane, and Willingham Road. Currently feed South Jefferson Wildwood and Jefferson High. Proposed to feed South Jefferson Charlestown Middle and Washington High. 15 students here, current grades 8 through 11, from Jefferson to Washington. You'll see before you all the areas that are proposed. 279 students, current grades 8 through 11, from Jefferson High to Washington High. This is the proposed new attendance zone for both Washington and Jefferson. Now, uh, and maybe, maybe you show this later but well, it would be helpful to see um, I mean th this shows obviously current students that makes sense but uh, it would be good to see what this proposed boundary looks like overlaid over the projected uh, growth and I, I realize to a degree that's been hopefully summarized and captured in this, but to visually, if we can, at some point, see what it is. I can't look at this and tell, you know, where, um, 
the projected uh, development is. Because I, I know we have to do this based not only to accommodate current students, but the growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. Um, those are, we do have the map for the growth that is a different mapping system out of GIS. Yeah, so and the school we boundary mapping boundary. system, they are, two, they are two different systems, but we can, um, we can post both of them and you can see them, our ability to lay one of them on top of the other. Let's um, find some smart has students some who can do limitations, that. but we'll, we'll work on that. Um, because in, in each one of these, the, the changes, and when we looked at the high school capacity, what we're trying to show, that section that you just saw, we did high school, then we did middle school the same way, then we did elementary the same way. We went, here's what you started with, here's the number of students that you have, here's the capacity, here's the low growth areas, here's the high growth areas, and if you move these particular ones that are geographically adjacent, this is how you will shift those, those capacity percentages. So with the ch all of these changes, pluses and deltas from Jefferson and Washington, you see, and the ROTC accounted for, okay. you see what the adjusted totals and the adjusted percentages are. So the proposed changes would result in a 91% capacity rate for Washington High and a 79% capacity rate for Jefferson High. That'd be a pretty significant shift. There is, however, later on in our presentation, a um, proposal that the committee felt fairly strongly about for rising seniors that would change that number. Um, however, it was felt that the, the work of getting Washington where, and you can see in the student density boundaries, the, the vast majority of that growth happens to be falling in where Jefferson is now. And for us to take that border and pull some of it back into Washington. Make no mistake, both of our high schools are going to be crowded. They are going to be crowded for a while. We are over 85% capacity if you count every single seat in both of those schools and every single kid. We're at 85%. We're simply trying to move things to give ourselves the most amount of time before we're absolutely full in both places and have to start putting up trailers, quite frankly. Do you have a question? Um, can you give us some insight from the committee maybe on what the, the thought process was as far as where they pulled the boundaries? Mm -hmm. um, as far as heading down 340 as opposed to possibly using nine that takes you a straight bus shot up to to washington mm -hmm. such a development such as like fairfax crossing or you know mm -hmm. something that would seem to make i mean in my mind because this is the first time that we you know see i i was quite surprised i'm thinking it just seemed like it was obvious. The Breckenridge is what, to me, seems the most odd. Going down Country Club Road and taking half of the kids and kind of pulling them out this way when you head right down Country Club, take a right near Jefferson. It would make more sense if you're going to take a development that's maybe equally, you know, socioeconomically. I think you have to keep that in mind as well to not increase that or decrease that at one school or the other. That would be another option that would be somewhat similar, but also a growth area mm -hmm. that would then maybe move at least one growth pattern mm -hmm. to Washington. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, because that that area there, if you head down that way, yes, you're going to get another possibly 550 units at the corner of Country Club. Then that half, so you'd almost have like the right side of the road going there or the left side, but you don't even have that because you take Bellier and Sleepy Hollow, so you're still on the right side of the road. So it just doesn't seem to be as, as a very a very delineated boundary. It's kind of like a, we just kind of wound through. But that's my that's my thought so far as far as what I've seen, just as a quick snapshot. Mm -hmm. So, and certainly part of putting this out there is to get feedback. The committee looked at multiple options for each one of those. So 
uh, to your point, and you hit on several of them, Asante. Number one, we looked at transportation. There were some places where we said, wow, geographically, this is over here. Can we pull these kids into, you know, Harper's Ferry? And then Larry would look at us and say, actually, you can't get there from here. You would have to go around to come. So some of them were based on transportation routes and him advising, yes, that looks close, but you can't do a direct route from here to here. You'd have to go a around a group of students who would be going to the other school in the opposite direction. It doesn't make sense. Um, we also pulled the socioeconomics from every single one of the schools. We did their percentage free and reduced lunch. We made a conscious effort not to exacerbate some of the standing socioeconomic um, gaps that we have in our schools. Um, uh, it leads us, as you heard earlier tonight, that can lead to uh, some negative consequences that we, we don't want to fuel. So some of them, we looked at neighborhoods and made decisions either not to move them or to move them based on where they would have went and how they would have changed the demographics. For some of our schools, some changes could have pushed them out of Title I status, raised their socioeconomics to the extent that they no longer qualified for tens of thousands of dollars in federal funding, which we would have lost, or in some cases, they would have pushed a school into a different socioeconomic status. So we tried to keep those um, in consideration as well. In addition to Mr. Sutta's point, we had this map with each one of the growth areas. For, so for some of those neighborhoods, it was just a step-by-step step of, well, this, if we move this neighborhood, it may meet our needs now, but then is it going to exceed them? If we keep it in five years, it's going to push this too far in the other direction. And truthfully, that nowhere was that clear or more difficult than for Washington High, simply because um, they're both at such heavy capacity. The fact that they're both at 85%, we have so little room to tinker with that. Um, but all, all of those were factors in each one of them. But again, a part of going through this process is hearing from people who have different ideas. We have 14 people on this committee, including, you know, the uh, county planners, transportation staff, administrative staff, teachers, service personnel, parents. So um, there's collective thought process is always better. So the more suggestions that we get, I'm sure that the better the proposal will get. Middle school. Our current middle school district. Our current Charlestown Middle. 75.38 square miles. Mm -hmm. Currently has six, 672 students, grades 6, 7, and 8. <coughs> current Harbors Ferry Middle District. 48.7 square miles, 519 students, grades 6, 7, and 8. Current Shepherdstown Middle, 50.54 square miles, 343 students, grades 6, 7, and 8. And Wildwood Middle, 40.14 square miles, 523 students, grades 6, 7, and 8. Our elementary to middle feeder, going to go through this one I think just a little bit quicker if you if you want to stop us uh, let us know we, this they're all the same through the middle and elementary um, and it's done the same way and again I think all this is going to be online I believe tomorrow by close of business if everything works out well the area of Hidden River off of Route 51 wide horizon area and Harry Shirley Road The east side of Lee Town Road from Route 51 to Old Middleway Pike, and the south side of Old Lee, Old Lee Town Pike from Lee Town Road to, but not including, Dark Lane. The areas of North Childs Road, Rose Hill Drive, Shadowhawk Lane, and Willingham Road. The south side of Route 51 from the Berkeley County line to Ambler Road.
the preserves at barley wood. The area of Luther Jones Road, Melvin Road, and parts of Warm Springs, Ridge Road, and Route 230. These students currently attend uh, Wildwood and the proposal would be Shepherd County. The area of Patrick Henry Estates, uh, the area behind Walmart, currently Wildwood and Jefferson, proposed to Harpers Ferry and Washington High. Community of Breckenridge, currently at Wildwood Middle and Jefferson, to Harpers Ferry in Washington. The areas of Bel Air and Sleepy Hollow, currently Wildwood and Jefferson, proposed Harpers Ferry in Washington. The area of Uvilla, including Uvilla Road, Kidwalla Road, and sections of Engle Molars and Shepherdstown Pike. Currently, Harper's Ferry Middle proposed to Shepherdstown Middle. The area of Cable Town Road from Route 115 to Myerstown Road, including Avon Bend, Mount Hammond Lane, also including the communities of Crosswind and Oakland Terrace. Currently, at Charlestown and Washington and Page Jackson, uh, the proposed Blue Ridge Campus, Harper's Ferry Middle, and Washington. Before you in, in the yellow, you'll see the all the proposal. And what it would look like afterwards. And I think that's one of the uh, clearest illustrations. If you look at the distribution heat map and you see where we have all of this strong growth in the center of the county, and we're needing to push some of this population further out to our schools that are on the periphery that are not as full because that's where we keep filling them back up. So with middle schools, we currently have more room in middle schools than anywhere else in our system. We are only sitting at 62% capacity if you count every single seat and every single kid. So there's plenty of space in our middle schools. We certainly would like to keep them as equitable as possible. And, and actually we have them within a 10 percentage point range of one another uh, to be able to cover those. Bless you here. And a lot of these were facilitating movement out of Wildwood in the center of the county where we have the highest level of growth out to Harper's Ferry where we had the absolute most space. They were sitting about 50% um, and up to Shepherdstown Middle School where we have where we had good space. So those those proposed changes keep all of our schools between 58 and 69 percent full capacity. Elementary. The current elementary two feeder pattern. And again, we're just going to kind of keep going through it like we did the middle school. The current Blue Ridge. The current North. Current Page Jackson Elementary. Current Ranson Elementary, current Shepherdstown Elementary, current South Jefferson Elementary, current Wright Denny, current T.A. Lowry, current Driswood. Kind of give you some sense of, you got a, a key up here, the dark orange when we when you see it will be the outgoing students, the proposed students that will come out of that particular district and the bright yellow will be the proposed students coming into that particular district. Also a note, uh, the middle and high school uh, proposals include students numbers for next school year. For example, current grades fifth, sixth, fifth, sixth and seventh. The elementary pro proposal is current kindergarten through fifth 
because of the unknown rising kindergartners that are out there yet waiting to be enrolled. In addition, uh, there's no adjustments to the pre-K district. Areas of Avon Bend, Myerstown, Mount Hammond Lane, Crosswinds, and Oakland Terrace. Currently, they attend Page Jackson, Wright Denny, Charlestown Middle and Washington, the proposal, Blue Ridge Campus, Harpers Ferry Middle and Washington High. Areas of Wide Horizon, Archer Road, Harry Shirley Road, and part of Lee Town Road. Currently, they attend T.A. Lowry, Wildwood, and Jefferson, the proposal, North Jefferson, Shepherdstown, and Jefferson. Community of Spruce Hill. Currently attend South Jefferson, Charlestown Middle, and Washington, the proposal, Page Jackson, Wright Denny Intermediate, Charlestown Middle, and Washington High. The area of Ranson Estates. Currently, they attend Ranson Elementary, then Wildwood, then Jefferson. The proposal, T.A. Lowry, Wildwood, and Jefferson. Areas of Persimmon Lane, Whitmer Road, French Road, Gardner's Lane, Deerfield, Deerfield Village, and parts of Ridge Road, Flowing Springs Road, Shepherdstown Pike, and Ingle Molers Road. They currently attend Shepherdstown Elementary, Shepherdstown Middle, and Jefferson High. The proposal, T.A. Lowry Elementary, Shepherdstown Middle, and Jefferson High. The area of Duncan Road and Knott Road. They currently attend Shepherdstown Elementary, Shepherdstown Middle, and Jefferson High. Their proposed T.A. Lowry Elementary, Shepherdstown Middle, and Jefferson High. We see it again, this time in bright yellow. The areas of Persimmon Lane, Whitmer Road, French Road, Gardner's Lane, Deerfield Village, parts of Ridge Road, Flowing Springs, Shepherdstown Pike, and Ingle Molers, and Duncan and Knott Road. <coughs> to um, currently attend Shepherdstown Elementary, Shepherdstown Middle, and Jefferson High. The, the proposal, T.A. Lowry, Shepherdstown Middle, and Jefferson High. And again, we see Shep uh, Ranson Estates, also the area of Lance Street and parts of North and South Marshall Street. Uh, they currently attend Ranson Elementary, Wildwood, and Jefferson. The proposal, T.A. Lowry, Wildwood, and Jefferson. The area of Blue Moth. Those seven students currently attend Page Jackson Elementary, Charlestown Middle, and Washington High. Uh, just to give you guys some, some uh, geographics, the star in the lower right-hand corner is uh, off of Route 7, east of Berryville. And that's uh, how we have to pick those young people up. Uh, we travel Route 7 headed towards Leesburg and go we'll pick them up because they live in Jefferson County. The proposal would be to uh, attend South Jefferson, Charlestown Middle, and Washington High. For CW Shipley, there are no boundary adjustments proposed. Nor are there boundary adjustments proposed for Driftwood Elementary. Is that because of where they are number-wise? Yes, ma'am. And probably because those were the last two redistricted those were probably the most evened out and had had the least amount of time for for uneven growth to occur those were both dead center within a dozen students or less of what an ideal they should have been percentage wise and they were not passed through we actually had some other schools that also were very close on their percentages but we would have had to have gone around that to take students from a more crowded school to a less crowded school. So some of them, like Wright Denny, is a is a pass through school. In order for us to alleviate some crowding in the center of the county, we need to pull some kids off to Blue Ridge on the outside of Wright Denny to pull some more kids in on the other side. Before you, you'll see all the current elementary schools once again. The proposals are in bright yellow. And then we'll do the overlay of the proposed, proposed new elementary school attendance zone. 
And once again, as you saw with every single one of the proposals, we go section by section, show you what their current is, what the adjustment would be, and what their percentages would be after the proposal. After the proposal, other than Washington High, and we're going to talk about that in just a second, we would not have a single school that would exceed 85% in terms of their percentages. Um, for elementary, actually, we got a pretty tight range. Um, we got from 68% out at Blue Ridge campus up to the highest <coughs> being 82%. And the two that are the 82, well, one of those is Wright Denny, which is a high growth area. And the other one is Shepherdstown, which although it's full, is a low growth area. There's not a lot of infill. There's not a, places, a lot of places to build up there. So um, those at 82% even us out we are at 77 percent overall as a school system at the elementary level so when we are talking about overall this is a pretty large change for the school system so how many students are we talking about this affecting at elementary a total of 341 students would be reassigned or about eight and half percent of our complete K-5 population right now. At middle, it would be 210 students, which is just under 11% of the total population. And at high school, it would be 279 students, or about 10%. As you all know, that was where we needed the largest uh, shift. So in totality, um, before any amendments to this 838 students or nine percent of our of who will be in our school population next year k through 11 would be redistricted beginning in the 2017-2018 school year so as i stated earlier the committee we had and i'll talk a little bit more about the committee in, the, in a moment but we had a lot of good discussion about not just numbers. Uh, numbers are important. They help you to be objective and to make decisions, but they don't tell the whole story. I think everybody on the committee was very, very conscious that every one of those numbers represents a kid and their family. And one of the things that the committee felt fairly strongly about is that if someone has spent the last three years of their high school career as a cougar turning around and asking them their senior year to become a patriot is not something that we would do unless it were on the most dire circumstances. Um, it's just you form those relationships and those bonds, that familiarity, your performance. We, we didn't want those things to suffer. So we went back and located every single 11th grader who would be affected by this proposal. There are 67 of them in total. It was our understanding based on some of the historians in the group who had more experience that previously when Washington High and Jefferson High, when Washington High was built and that we redistricted, seniors were allowed to finish out at Jefferson High their senior year, but only if they transported themselves. And uh, a lot of our discussion was that uh, that benefits a certain socioeconomic group in our county who can make that decision. And uh, where you get to spend your senior year shouldn't depend on whether or not your parents can afford to buy you a car or drive you every day. So the committee worked with transportation um, to come up with a proposal to allow the seniors who would be affected by this proposal to remain in their current placement, which would be Jefferson for those. Um, those 67 students maximum cost to do that would be $37,200. We hope that we can get it down to less and a number of those students would have their own transportation, but if every single one of us needed them to drive them in order to finish out their senior year at Jefferson High, that would be the maximum cost. Um, if you factor in allowing those 67 uh, seniors to finish out at Jefferson, it evens out the first year shift to Jefferson High being at 83% capacity and Washington High being at 87% capacity. It makes that, while it does shift more of the population to Washington, which was our intent, there's less growth in the Washington area, and Washington High School itself being much later construction has um, 
uh, more space. The hallways are wider, the ceilings are higher, there, there's more windows, there's more light. It's simply newer construction. It's easier for us to handle larger groups of kids and moving larger groups of kids around in Washington than in Jefferson. Um, but it was important to the committee that we put this proposal on the table because um, the, the, the kids who are behind all of these numbers. So this slide shows with all of the proposed adjustments what the feeder patterns would look like. If you'll look in there, you will notice that the vast majority of them are 100% clean feeder patterns. I will tell you, having done this in many, many districts in actually several different states, it it is astonishing to me, and this is one of the highest rates of 100% clean feeder patterns I've ever seen. Typically, geographically, it's just, just not possible to get clean feeds into places. Um, and the two places where we couldn't actually get a 100%, um, T.A. Lowry and Driswood, part of that is just uh, uh, size, C.W. Shipley, where, where they're at in the center of the county. But for all of them, we tried to make sure that if you were going to have to split, there's at least enough, sort of like our current with Wildwood, when you only have 2% of your population that peels off and goes to Washington High and all of their friends go to Jefferson High, that's a very uh, difficult thing on friendships and uh, neighborhoods. So we tried to make sure that with each one of these, if there was going to be a split, there'd be enough students to sort of have a cohort to go through there. So having said that, um, this was the work of many, many, many hours that people spent away from their children and their families on top of their job uh, in the evening. And um, if the folks who are here on the committee, I'd like to recognize them. Mr. Ralph Dingus is Assistant Superintendent of Operations. Mr. Stand up, Ralph. <laughs> Mr. You did that work. Don't, I mm, don't cut yourself. Okay, uh, Pat Blanc, Assistant Superintendent. Stand up, I know you're checking the scores. You <laughs> Larry Willingham, Transportation and Routing. Uh, Todd Fagans is the GIS planner for uh, Jefferson and did a tremendous amount of work for us. Jennifer Brockman, uh, county planner. Terry Young, who represented all of the service personnel uh, very passionately, as she always does. I love that about you. Rhonda Reynolds, who is the teacher representative for WVEA. Lene Fragamini, teacher representative for AFT. Chris Walter, who's the elementary principal representative. Judy Marcus, who... Uh, had the most uh, upheaval to hers, and actually, um, and with good grace and composition, worked through that process. Uh, Miss Julia Tracy, parent representative, is here. I saw her earlier. Miss Erica Logan, parent representative, and Miss Colony Velez, parent representative, who very graciously were able to have discussions and work through both. Uh, a lot of good questions about not not their children and their their issues but all children and how it would affect them and a lot of conversations about relationships and about how this was going to affect us in the future and I can't begin to articulate to you the number many 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 hours that they spent working on these proposals and uh, most systems farm this kind of work out and pay professionals to do it outside of here and they did all of it on their own back so thank you very much. So um, we have, as we have presented very ambitiously back in October, a timeline, um, we've altered that somewhat because we had such a, we worked through neighborhood by neighborhood and school by school and it took some time. So um, we are, tonight's our first recommendation of the draft to the board. We will be posting for public comment tomorrow up on our website. Once we have all of the maps, the presentation, each one of the areas and the public comment button working. I'm hoping to have all of those tomorrow. Um, we will send out both an email to every single staff person of ours with a link and then we will send out a school messenger to all of the parents in the county to come and see those. Um, we will also be having uh, public forums. We plan at least two public forums in different parts of the county so the folks who couldn't come to the school board meeting or who may not have computer access can come and see a live version of this again, very scintillating. 
Um, in December, on December the 12th, we will bring the first round of public comment back to the board and say, from our public forums, from online, here's everything that we've gotten. What changes would you like to incorporate in this? What would you like to consider? We'll go back out for public comment for the remainder of December and the beginning of January with any uh, revisions from that, and then come back again in January. Um, at that time, we hope to be asking for approval. I, um, there's no rigid timeline. We're not beholden to the state. Our, really, our biggest issue is that once we make any shifts in student population, there are enormous resource shifts that go with this. Transportation routes, moving teachers, moving aides, moving admin, moving money for the per pupil, moving intervention programs. So um, once those decisions are made, that's when all the real work starts for all the staff behind the scenes so that we have everything prepared to start off successfully in 2017. So the later we push that date the more we push our staff up against deadlines to do all the logistics behind it okay so and i and i want to please take a picture of this and share it with all your friends and bus rides <laughs> it says well, anyways, we do not anticipate riffing anyone this redistricting is not about us cutting staff Quite frankly, it's about we are growing and we need more staff and we have less money. As of right now, I think all total we've cut what what been about 1.2 million in the year and a half that I've been here, and we're about to go and cut another 350. While we're growing and our kids need more, so for us. This is about us being efficient enough with our resources so that we keep everybody employed. We will have transfers as a result of this. You can't move 800 kids around and not move the adults around to serve them. But that process will be done with an enormous amount of notification and discussion. Uh, this past year we had 58 transfers um, and all of those, I think, and mostly thanks to our personnel reps that I deeply appreciate, went very, very well because everybody had information. They knew what we were doing. We were very transparent about what the options were, why those came up, and we had a good conversation with our staff. I think people realize that once you hit, you know, pushing 10,000 kids, we have to run the logistics of Jefferson County Schools as if it's a business. It is. We are an $87 million a year, 1,200 employee <coughs> business. And there are some of the business things about doing that that we have to get good at or we're not going to be able to keep up the people end of it. So I am happy to take any questions from the board or any direction. <coughs> Well, thank you, Dr. Gibson. Uh, first, uh, let me turn it to my colleagues for any questions, but uh, on behalf of the board, a uh, huge thank you to the committee uh, for your efforts thus far. 